So, uh, so today, this week, we're going to be talking about actionable information. Actionable information. Um, this is something I've been alluding to, something I've been talking about for quite a while in this, uh, in this class. So let's go ahead and, and dig into this. Again, as you have questions, feel free to ask, interrupt me. Okay, so actionable information. Let's get a handle on what this really means. Uh, here we're talking about end users, customers, stakeholders, and decision makers. Okay? GIS is without a doubt a fantastic decision support tool. And I want to, again, uh, early in the semester I talked about this, um, and I want to stress it that GIS is not a decision making tool. In fact, never allow GIS or any computer software to make the decision. Okay, there's lots more going on up here in your head if you're the decision maker um, that could, should be taken into account. Use the GIS data as information to help you form your decision, but don't you know, never get to the point where you say, well, the computer said this, therefore that's what we got to do. Okay? So it's a fantastic decision support tool, yet the decision makers are often what's called drowning in data thirsting for information. Okay, so we have to understand why, why are folks saying that? Uh, and I think part of that, I was actually uh, writing some stuff about actionable information yesterday, working on a little bit of a paper, and, um, and I'm starting to get a pretty good idea why this is happening, but we'll walk through this and see if we can all come up with about the same consensus. Um, let's talk about the data to wisdom pathway. Okay, so here we have data on the very, very top, the broadest part of this uh, triangle, inverted pyramid that you're looking at here, is data. And my question to you is, and we got to make sure we all understand data the, the right way, is uh, what is data? What do we mean when we say the word data? The second piece there is what do we mean by information? Notice that that is getting narrower. We're taking a bunch of data and it is being distilled down into a smaller bunch of information and then yet a smaller group of what's called knowledge, what we could call knowledge and ultimately at the very pinnacle here or the, the point is wisdom. Wisdom being appropriate application of knowledge. Okay, so let's, let's do this. Let's start with each of these and go through them to understand what we really mean by these terms. Uh, what is data? Well, that's an example of data. Right? You see a bunch of numbers here in this column or this field, a bunch of numbers here, and a bunch of words over here. Unless you're really, really familiar with what all this stuff is, it's just numbers and letters and words, right? It's data. Okay? Anyone have a clue what this might be? Yeah, it's watershed. Uh-huh. Yeah. Okay, so what is information? Information has to be in context. Right? Some sort of con has to be put into some sort of context. It has to be meaningful to the person reading that data. You know, the computer doesn't understand anything, right? It's literally just zeros and ones. Displayed to us, uh, we can look at it and read it. In some cases, I don't know what that stuff is, right? In other cases, oh, we start figuring it out. Now all that I've done is I've added some um, field names or labels to this. So now we're, we're putting it into some sort of context. G uh, IT for GIS, we're starting to understand. We get an idea that this is watershed, watershed polygons. Uh, this is the acreage of each of these individual watersheds. The HUC hydrologic unit code at the eighth level designated for us. Watershed boundary database, the name of each of those. Okay, so now we've got some context. We can, we can see this data in that context. And being GISers, it's, it's becoming meaningful to us. Um, a lot of us probably worked with watershed data in the past. So now this is starting to help us out, figure it out. Well, what is knowledge? Knowledge requires, again, it has to be in some sort of context. 
It has to become meaningful to us, and it has to speak to you, part of your paradigm. This is where, you know, some of this data information may not become knowledge to one person, but does become knowledge to another person. Um, so let's say that we have a person who's a um, business marketing right, type of person. They're a business person. Are they going to have the same appreciation for a watershed as a hydrologist? No. Okay, so paradigm uh, is all of, those, uh, all of those things that you've experienced in your life that help make your... Um, form your view of, of the world. Okay? That's, that's, that's your paradigm. Everyone has a paradigm. People who are in the same family tend to have a little closer, more similar paradigm. People who are maybe grew up in completely different parts of the world can, can have very, very different paradigms. It's that perspective or view on the world. right? Uh, and that carries through, of course, into your work. Okay? Uh, how well you understand um, hydrology, watersheds, uh, will make a difference about, now does this actually become knowledge to you, or is it still, you know, this is beyond me. It can be, certainly it's data, it can be information, okay, you can look at it and you can kind of understand it, but it may not speak to you. Okay, so we can start having some departure with given pieces of data, uh, whether it becomes knowledge for one person versus the other. And then lastly, we have wisdom, right? Again, it has to be in context, it has to be meaningful, it has to speak to you, part of your paradigm. And then what we're doing is we are applying, applying all that stuff, data, information, uh, the knowledge that we've gained from it, to make some sort of decision usually, to answer some sort of question. And that then is the appropriate use of that knowledge. That then is what we call, what's called wisdom. We can ask, where has all the wisdom gone? You know, have you ever looked at, this is a great example to me, have you ever looked at the writings of our founding fathers? You know, Mason, Madison, Jefferson. I think a lot, a lot of students in today's world going through high school and, and early years in college aren't exposed to these guys anymore. Uh, if you look at it though, these guys spent uh, a tremendous amount of their life, this time period, forming, you know, today what we call our, um, well, first of all, the Declaration of Independence, and then the, um, the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. You know, this isn't something that these guys worked on for, let's do this in two weeks, right? They, they spent a tremendous amount of time, and I think there's a lot of wisdom in what they have written, written down uh, for, for the ages, right? Now back to GIS, and more specifically looking at geographic information systems, um, we want to start asking this question. Are we delivering data, or are we delivering information? How many in here have heard the word, the term, big data, which now looks like one word, big data? Yeah, you've heard of it. Um, and, and my joke that I've said earlier is that GIS was big data before there was such a thing called big data. We've always kind of pushed the envelope of you know, large file sizes, filling up network networks and all that good stuff. But there's more to big data uh, than just the size of the data itself. What I'm, what I'm starting to see is that, um, number one, the quantity of data that people are deluged with, that they're hit with, even every day. Right, you get on your emails, you get these blasts from RSS feeds, or you, you go out to a news site and you look at what's going on in the world today. You, you just get blasted with data. Okay? And uh, um, it's also, you also get blasted quickly with data because the internet allows for near real-time reporting near real-time news feeds, all this good stuff like this. There's problems with that, though. One of the problems is the fact that um, a lot of times that data is just blasted out there by non-authoritative sources, completely unchecked, 
Is it accurate? Is it, is it correct? Do we have this right or wrong? It's just, I got to get this story out there. Or I want to be the first one to post this on my Twitter account or something. And then people see that. And a lot of people don't ask that question. Is this correct? Is this right? And there's a lot of, I think, loss of some critical thinking. Uh, people are, are hit with this. And if you see it three different times, oh, it's got to be right. I saw it three different times on the internet. Yeah, but dig back and see. It's all coming from the same one source who is just, who knows, right? It's non-authoritative, right? Quality assurance we talk about in GIS. We talk about quality control measures, right? And very oftentimes, that stuff's gone. It's almost like it, we could benefit greatly by having a filter, right? Uh, to get rid of the noise and just give me the signal. Give me the truth. Mm. Whatever that happens to be sometimes. Um, so then we go back to this whole idea, delivering data or information. Now I've been involved in, in the wildfires this year, the California wildfires, uh, several of the, some of the hurricanes uh, going through the, uh, the, the Caribbean um, this year. And what I saw is a lot of people wanting to help out, of course. Right? A lot of people said, man, we can help out with this whole thing. Um, but it was, this, it was this approach of just give them the data. We just got to do something, right? Give them whatever they want. So people were delivering data like this. OK, here's my website. Go grab it. No, here's mine. Look at all my stuff. I got imagery. I got all this stuff. Download this, download that, download this, download that, download everything. These are, these are just, this is for one project. Pages and pages. I'm only showing you three. Click here, grab this one. Click here, grab that one. Click what well, I got. And I did this. I, did, I didn't do every one. <laughs> I click on some of them, and it's like, oh, you're not authorized to download this. You have to sign up for this email, or you have to sign up for something. Uh, and you click another one, and you get it. Oh, it's just a, it's just a JPEG. It's not geospatial. And you click another one. Let's look at this. Whatever, OK? So you have all this sort of stuff. And if you manage to download all of it, and maybe a, a certain percentage of it is good stuff, geospatial data, high quality stuff, then, you, when, then what you find out is of that subset that is GIS, oh, this one's projected in this system. That one's projected in that system. This one is unprojected. I don't even know what the system is. There's no metadata with it. How do I use it? Well, I just can't use some of it. It's unprojected. I don't know how it's going to fit correctly and overlay uh, correctly with the rest of my data. Do I trust it? You know, whatever. Um, and you've got a lot of work to do. You've got a lot of work to do to filter through all this dumping of data on you. You figure it out. And then maybe ultimately some of that stuff does help you out. Um, but what I'm, what I'm starting to see is that that dumping of data, that deluging people with data, may be actually counterproductive. Because people are wasting their time. They would actually be better off using maybe known sources, using what they have, which may not be much, to start moving toward decisions instead of sifting through hundreds of pieces and finding out nothing helped me. Nothing's good. Yeah, and the other thing that we have to think about as GISers is we're dumping this data on non-GISers. Download this GeoTIFF. Download this GeoDatabase. Oh my gosh. What are the emergency response people going to do with a GeoDatabase? Oh, literally, what are they going to do with that? And they click on it. They say, oh, these, these people are helping me out. And they click on it. They download it. Say, what in the world? I don't know what this stuff is. I don't have this ArcGIS software. I don't have any GIS software. Now I've got to find someone who has some sort of GIS software that can at least show me this stuff. See? Um, so what we need to do as GISers is to start preparing. We do all of our work, right? We do our spatial analysis. We, we do this fantastic stuff. And then we want to make that data available to the decision maker because almost always the GISer is not the decision maker. Right? We're supporting, helping someone. Right? We've got to take it that step further. Not just data, but give them information. So 
instead of dumping this on them, clink, 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 why not dump something like this on them? You've seen this. You've seen this. This is the Re NASA Recover Decision Support System. And we have, in this case, 26 layers, not all turned on right now, all available. Turn them on, turn them off, zoom in, zoom out, do what you want. You don't have to be a GISer. You don't have to even have GIS software. All you got to have is an internet and a browser. Okay, do what you want with all this different stuff. You want even more data? Sure, fine. We've actually taken some of the stuff that's available here and integrated it into these maps. It's, you know, for the hurricane stuff, we did that. You know, made it available for people. You know, you click over here. You got reports. You can download the data if you are a GIS or do some more stuff with it. Um, but do you see the huge difference? between this and this. There's a giant difference. Now the other thing to make it into actionable information, actionable information, is we do not want to um, present some sort of data, let's say like fire severity. We don't want to present it as the dark red stuff um, or the darkest of red, uh, red type of stuff has a value of, of 1.936. And uh, uh, if there was some green colored stuff here, that has a value of negative um, 0.581. Person's like, what? what do those numbers mean? Right? Why are we showing them that? What's important is that they know that the dark red is high severity fires. The yellowish colors are moderate, medium severity. Greenish, low severity, or maybe even unburned. That's what they need to know. So with the way we present our geospatial data is important as well. Roads data should be symbolized so it looks sort of like the old Rand McNally's. Candy cane striped highways, you know? That's what they looked like. People are accustomed to that. The shielding like you would see on an interstate or on a state highway, you know, labeling. That's the type of stuff that we need to be delivering to whoever's looking at all of our stuff. Because again, they're not the GISers. They don't know about object ID fields and you know, all that stuff like, like we do. So that's kind of our job. That has become a huge job for us. Um, that's one of the complaints, if you want to call it that, that I saw in a, you know, it was a, it was a survey that came out last year. Um, and the, the, the survey said two things that GISers need to brush up on. Number one is better spatial analysis. Unfortunately, it looks like too many people are um, you know, getting good at maybe some web programming, automating something just to happen, just do it. But the quality of the spatial analysis is falling apart. Okay. Are you even applying the right tools? Or some people don't even know about really doing spatial analysis. You know, Moran's eye for looking for spatial autocorrelations or, or whatever, those sort of things. That was one of them, spatial analysis. That's a huge, powerful part of GIS, and we got to be good at it. The other one was communication. We're giving people data. There you go. See ya. Have fun. I worked on this all night. Oh, no, no, no. You, you haven't taken the last step. See? So that communication, this is what they're talking about. Taking the data, making it into actionable information. So, and what do we mean by actionable? That person can do something with it. They can take it from what you've given them and go to that next step in their paradigm, their world, their job description. Yeah, communication. How do we communicate with geospatial data? First of all, we do need data, ideally from reliable and or authoritative source or sources. We want to use standardized or accepted symbology, regardless of how you feel about it cartographically. Um, years ago, we produced, you know, one of the, I think it was one of the recover um, uh, layers, maps that we were producing, this is some years ago, uh, for the SMA layer, which is Surface Management Agency. So a certain color is applied to those polygon areas that are managed by the U.S. Forest Service. Certain color is applied, I think it was a yellowish color, is used for the BLM, another color for state, um, another color for private lands, and so on and so forth. Well, we looked at, we didn't even know that there was um, specific colors 
that the land management agencies were using. So we just symbolized it in a certain way. And we sent it off to BLM people that were working with us. And they came back and said, well, you got this all wrong because that land that you're showing is not BLM. I said, well, what, what, what land are you talking about? I mean, we got the data from you guys. Oh, yeah, but it's, it's not right. Well, what I found out is that they weren't necessarily really clicking on the polygon and learning about you know, who's, what's the agency managing this land. They're looking at the color. And that blue color or yellow color meant BLM. And if we applied that somewhere else, it's like, that's not BLM. <laughs> right? So w whether we feel good about that or not, we like their color scheme or not, if it's an accepted symbology that they're using, in these sort of situations where we're trying to deliver actionable information, we need to use that. Because so many folks, again, these aren't the GISers, they look at something and that color means something to them. That hatching pattern or whatever it is, that means something to them. So we need to use it. Okay? Also, consider generalization or reclassification. I mentioned this a little bit ago. Why not use high, medium, low instead of zero to 10,000? People will get bogged down in those numbers, you know? And you don't want them looking at that. They don't need to be studying that. They need to be studying the high, mediums, and lows. And just quickly understand, that's high severity fire, that's unburned, okay? Again, by looking at it and maybe glancing quickly uh, at that key or legend so they can kind of figure it out. Use meaningful values and meaningful words. Um, you know, don't, another good example would be like for, um, um, road type, road type one, road type two, road type three. What in the world is that? Well, as a GISer, you might know that road type four is interstate highways, road type three is U.S. highways, road type two, is, you know, state highways and local roads and whatever. Okay. <laughs> What's that? I had a, a road layer sent to me, and the yeah. guy wanted me to figure some stuff out. Uh -huh. You know, and that's exactly how it was: zero through nine. Uh huh. Yeah. And I yeah. called him, and I'm like, what? Yeah, what's your coding system? Give me some metadata uh -huh. or something, you know, give me uh -huh. something. So that I, mm -hmm. he's like, oh, zeros are... Yeah, he told you over the I phone. Think, you know. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, see, that, <laughs> and that's not too bad, because you're a GISer. You can at least understand, okay, it's some sort of coding system. Yeah. And you can then find out, you know, and ask that question. But as, when you're not even a GIS person, and you are you know, maybe dealing with an emergency, or just some sort of... Um, question where you're going to use geospatial data to help you make your decision. One through nine, I mean, come on. <laughs> what is this, you know? And you don't want people making assumptions. You know, you don't want people making, oh, I think that means this. Wow, that's not good. Because what they might think is um, that it's a ranking. Zero is very low traffic, and nine, lots of traffic. It's a graded system. Oh, it's not. It's a classification. So we understand all that, thematically versus, you know, continuous data, whatever. So we want to use that. Meaningful values, meaningful words. So what does all this mean, right? Do you guys know what authoritative source means, authoritative data means? So for, let, we were talking about road or street data. What would you think is an authoritative source for transportation data, road data? Which one? DOT, Department of Transportation. Every state has one. Here it's Idaho Transportation Department, ITD. Yeah, that's what I would look for, right? All right, um, you get the idea. Right? If we wanted um, uh, maybe some information on elevation, where might we go? USGS. I would say USGS, good place to go, right? Looking, maybe, maybe we're specifically looking for LIDAR data. That's the type of data. But USGS would be certainly a great place to start. Use meaningful units. This is another one. Acres instead of number of pixels. No one manages on pixels. I mean, can you even vis visualize what a pixel is out there, right, in the real world? I mean, pic pixel is a picture element, right? That's how we know that in GIS. This is raster data. That's how raster data is structured. The decision maker doesn't care about that, doesn't need to care about that. So instead of saying that there is 1,000 pixels of high severity fire or 25 pixels 
of high likelihood of a debris flow following a wildfire, something like this, tell them that there are 50 acres that are likely to have a debris flow following this wildfire. Or you have 600 acres of high severity fire. Okay? It doesn't take us much work to do this. But you see that little step is so huge to that decision maker. that uh, And that's what we have to be doing. We have to go that one extra step. Again, it'd be miles instead of meters. Sagebrush step instead of code 4622. Some people who really know their land cover codes, if they've worked in the field and maybe done some um, um, surveys out in the field, they might know 4622 is sagebrush step. But will everyone know 4622? No. Does everyone know, out west at least, what sagebrush step is or what sagebrush is? Sure. Right? So we're speaking to that large audience by, by uh, using those words and those units instead. So how much of the 2015 widget fire was considered a high severity burn? Well, the answer, real quick, and it's a correct answer, 1,968 pixels. Well, here's another correct answer. 1,771,200 square meters. Because we're working at Idaho Transverse Mercator, the unit distance is meters. Aerial uh, area type of distance, uh, or area measurements are square meters. So that would be um, 1,968 pixels, like we had before. And each pixel is 30 by 30 meters in size, it's a Landsat pixel. So each, meter, uh, each pixel is 900 square meters in size. Just do a little bit of math, we come up with that number. Oh, it's a correct answer, but is it still actionable information? No. I think most people are like, I still can't visualize that. Okay, well what about 437.673052 acres? Well, it's a little bit better. What does your mind automatically do with that when you see it? Don't you just do this. It's 437 acres, or you might even say a little over 400 acres. Right? Are you even sure of these? Are these really significant digits? That's another question, right? Consider that. But for actionable information, that's what we're giving them. You know? So how can we fix it? Brainstorm other ideas. You guys had already punched out some ideas already. Anything else? What else are you thinking? Examples. I think you can, you can ask people. I mean, mm -hmm. like on the symbology, for example. Yeah. You know, uh -huh. like you can, it's pretty easy to go to them and say, hey, what do you want? Yeah. Uh -huh. What do you want this thing to look like? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because it is yeah. like completely wide open when you first Present sure, you can just do what you want. You don't know. But, uh, and what you say might sound simple, might sound obvious, but it apparently is not obvious. Right. And it's a great thing. Because we don't have to disconnect ourselves from those end users. Why not engage those end users? Why not ask them? And that was a big driving force with our Recover project. And I'll, I'll, I'll still push it today that Recover is client centric. If they say, we want this layer, we don't want that layer. We want it to look like this. Sure. Why not? Because they're the ones who use it. Right. Right? Exactly. So we got that, that's, a, that's a really good point. We want to uh, do that sort of stuff. Anything else? I, do, I think it's OK to make suggestions, too. Sure. Cartographically, you know, this might present better. Yeah. Um, you want whatever. yellow over a nape image, mm -hmm. and yellow doesn't show up very well. Yeah. You know, could we do this instead? Yeah, I mean, that's right. Things uh -huh. like that. It yep. Yeah, certainly don't just sit there mute, because you, you, you have your profession, too. You can add something to that whole discussion uh, using your professional skill. And you could say, hey, do you know that we could actually prepare a data layer that would answer the question you're telling me about? You know, so for instance, th as an example of that, I have heard and I've been told that one of the reasons why the land management agencies use or they need slope, okay, slope data uh, when they're dealing with um, active fire incidents, 
um, wildfire incidents is that they look for places where the slope exceeds um, 30 degrees. And once it exceeds 30 degrees, they know that they can only put people on that slope. They can't put wheeled vehicles. They can't put tracked vehicles. It becomes too dangerous that the things are just going to fall over, you know, flip over, whatever, those sort of problems. So I heard that, and I'm like, OK, I'll, I'll still give them slope. In fact, some agencies want to have slope in percent. Some wanted to have it in, in degrees. So we give it both, to, you know, give, it, give them both. But then I said, why don't we just help them out? One more step. So I did the analysis very quickly to, f to take the slope in degrees in this case, queried it with the raster calculator with the question, slope greater than or equal to 30 degrees, 30. Created a whole new TIF that became part of the package. Now they don't have to look at that and try to click around or what color means higher than 30? No, they just turn on that layer. Ah, that's all the places. So we can use our, our, our skills as well and say, you know, you guys told me about this all the time, so we just made this layer. Do you like it? Oh, that's cool. Yeah, why, we'll use it. You know? Why not? OK, a checklist. So once you've finished your spatial analysis uh, and you are ready to deliver the results, ask yourself, how can I explain this so the results can immediately support sound decisions or sound decision making? How can I best communicate these data? How can I help turn these data or results into actionable information? And one of the best ways I've seen to do this is just to visualize or to um, pretend, right, simulate that you're given this data and no one's there to answer questions. You're, you're just looking at that thing on the screen, looking at it on a piece of paper. Can you figure it out? What is this really meaning? And if you have questions about what does this mean, what does that mean, does this, does this mean this or that, then you haven't completed all this. Okay? You should be able to deliver that product, and it's going to be able to stand on its own. Yeah, and GIS is great because people can click and ask those questions with the mouse. What is this? And really dig into it. But you don't want to have people assuming, because there's going to be mistakes oftentimes, and you don't want them getting the wrong impression about what your analysis or what your data is really meaning. There's that study results right there. Communication, and then they went on uh, also interpersonal skills, self-motivation, independence, so on and so forth. Communication is one that struck me, especially when I dug into it. OK, questions. Any questions or further discussion on this whole concept of actionable information? <coughs> 